Coral Gables Congregational Church. As I say every week, we are part of the United Church of Christ and we welcome you, no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey. A very special welcome to our visitors and guests. We are so very honored by your presence today. And we also want to extend a warm welcome to those who are worshiping with us online from around the world. We are so grateful for your presence with us as well. I'm going to ask now that everyone please sign in. For those of you in the pews, there are red pads in the inside part of the pews. If you would pick those up, sign in, let us know of your presence today. Visitors and guests, we would love if you would give us a little more information so we can send you a letter of welcome this week. And if you pass them down and pass them back, look at the names of folks around you so you can greet each other by name during and following our service. Also speaking of following our service, visitors, we'd love to have you come to our fellowship hall for not only a time of informal conversations and refreshments where all of us gather as well, but also to gather at our welcome table and we have a small gift for you there. I also encourage you to sign on at Facebook, let folks know that you are worshiping here today with us at Gables UCC. Today, after our service, our Green Christians Committee has been working very hard at commemorating this Earth Day weekend, and so we invite all of you to come into the Fellowship Hall and likewise to enjoy some refreshments, but more importantly today, to look at the various booths that are available to help all of you get some information and some help in leaving a greener footprint on this beloved Earth. One of the booths is a very interesting one, and I'm going to ask David, David, where are you? Right here, if you'll go up there. David is going, David Marshall is going to share a few words about how you can participate in a very special project. Good morning. One of the initiatives that the Green Christians have uh, been working on in this church is a, uh, a new initiative about fuel economy. You may be aware that the companies in the United States that sell cars are required to have a certain average fuel economy of the cars they sell. These standards are called CAFE, or Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards. Well, we decided in the Green Christians group that, that we don't need to wait for a government agency or someone else to impose some standards. We're taking an initiative to see how we're doing as a congregation by inventing a church average fuel economy. So we'd like you to come by the booth this after, uh, right after the service in Fellowship Hall. Let us know what kind of car you drive and about how many miles per week you drive it. So we can have a composite and we can also show if we were to change our own behaviors with respect to the kind of car we drive or maybe how many miles we drive it or whether we share it with someone else, how that would affect the use of, that, uh, of fuel and carbon burning in our own congregation. So we'll look for you in the fellowship hall after service. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Finally, over this past week, many of you have called or emailed me asking what this congregation is doing or what the United Church of Christ, our denomination, is doing about the recent horrific earthquake in Ecuador. I invite you to turn to page 12 in your bulletin. In there is a little paragraph about what the United Church of Christ has already started to do to help those with immediate needs and then the long-range plans that the denomination will be establishing and doing, they are always there for the long haul when other organizations and agencies have to leave a country or a situation because there's something else happening. The United Church of Christ remains with its partners that are in that particular area. So if there's information there. Um, if you would like to extend, um, put a check in the offering plate today and write on an Ecuador, we'd gladly receive it. If you want to mail it throughout the week, that would be great. Or if you want to go to our website, you can also give online there specifically to Ecuador or to Disaster Relief through the United Church of Christ. The rest of the announcements are in the bulletin. Please take a look. Join us throughout the week for any of our offerings, events, and programs. It will always be good to welcome you. So friends, indeed, in the beauty of this day, in the warmth of this community, in the joy that we share together as people of faith, 
but is gathered together in a time of worship.
Holy One, Creator of the Universe, we are still basking in the glory and joy of Easter morning. The stone was rolled away. The stones which have trapped us, our worries, anxieties, fear of change, struggles to get ahead and acquire more, need not hold us captive any longer. Empower us to live as disciples of your risen Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. 
But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send it to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Friends, listen. God is still speaking. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the most moving and transformational encounters I have ever heard of comes from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. As you know, after the British Empire left India, the country was thrown into religious and civil war. Gandhi began severe times of fasting and prayer, like Queen Esther, in hopes of bringing the nation to its senses. One day, a Hindu man approached Gandhi. The man was insane from grief and from the violence he had witnessed and committed himself. He told the Mahatma that Muslims killed his young son, and in return, he killed a young Muslim boy. He wept before Gandhi and told him he knew that he was damned to hell for eternity. Gandhi wept too at the senseless loss of two young lives and the man's pain. But then he responded. He told the Hindu man that he knew a way out of hell for him. He told him he needed to find a Muslim boy about the same age as his son, an orphaned Muslim boy whose family had been killed. He needed to adopt this boy, take him into his Hindu home, and embrace him, love him as his own son but he needed to raise him Muslim. This is the way out of hell, he said. This is a story that hits the core of the monumental change that needed to be embraced for the country of India to move forward as one in peace. This is the story that leapt into my mind when I first read today's scripture like Gandhi's call for the man to embrace the other while respecting the other, today's scripture is a transformational encounter that touches the very core of who the young church includes and who it did not include. Each week during our season of Easter, our readings confirm another way in which God is rolling stones away that lead to death and opening the followers of Jesus to new life. Today's scripture verses, I believe, are at the heart 
of the book of Acts. Acts begins with the ascension of Jesus. And I think the question the book strives to answer is, will Christianity continue without Jesus' physical presence? And the answer is a resounding yes. It will thrive through the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit. The book begins with Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, which is later fulfilled in reference to our Jewish ancestors in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. And then for the Gentiles in today's chapter. It is always interesting to look back at our early Christian roots and to understand if any Gentile, that is a non-Jew, wanted to become a follower of Jesus, they had to convert to Judaism first. One had to be Jewish to follow Jesus. And that meant observing the holiness codes written in the Torah. Jewish males were circumcised, and according to the food prohibitions in Leviticus chapter 11, Jewish families were not to eat certain meats or eat with certain people. These two laws or commandments comprise only a small part of the holiness code within Judaism. You may think that there are only 10 commandments, but there are actually 613 commandments in the Torah to be observed. These purity laws encompass every aspect of being human, birth, death, sex, gender, health, economics, jurisprudence, social relations, hygiene, marriage, behavior, and most certainly ethnicity, as Gentiles were automatically considered impure. The story today is actually the retelling of an event in the previous chapter of Acts, chapter 10. But in today's verses, it is retold by Peter himself. It must be really important if the author wrote it in chapter 10 and then tells it again in chapter 11. It alerts us, the reader, to pay extra close attention that what is happening is crucial information for us. On Peter's return to Jerusalem, after a visit to the Gentile home of Cornelius, who was a centurion living in Caesarea, Peter is charged with breaking the laws to which the community of Jesus followers had lived all of their lives. The laws that made them a community and made them who they are. What were the charges? Peter ate with uncircumcised men, and he ate unclean food in their homes. We might not think that this is a big deal today. But again, these were laws and restrictions that gave the Jewish people their identity as being in relationship to God and as being God's chosen people. Even when Jesus himself challenged these laws consistently, in his table ministry that always included visiting and eating with the unclean, the earlier followers used these observances to separate themselves from the Gentiles. And I can certainly understand on some level their predicament. They are a community in crisis. After Jesus' death, they were persecuted. They were exiled from the synagogue. Let's not forget that the temple where God lived had been destroyed. And Jesus, their teacher and friend, was no longer walking among them, nor had he returned as they had hoped. It would have been crazy to invite those who were persecuting them into their own community as equals, as brothers and sisters. So I can imagine why they would make it difficult for outsiders to join in, requiring adult male circumcision and a total dietary makeover would be adequate to keep most people out. This was a community, a young community, struggling to establish its clear identity, 
hold on and survive. They must have wondered often how they would continue. Peter tells them, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who has a major role in the unfolding of the early Christian church, Peter tells them of a dream, a vision he had, and of a vision that the Gentile Cornelius had as well. He tells the circumcised gathering that God spoke both to a circumcised and uncircumcised male alike. And if that wasn't amazing enough, God sent a surprising, unusual, and forbidden vision of a picnic to him. A blanket spread with all kinds of food that were prohibited for Jewish people. And God told Peter to eat them. Three times, patiently and lovingly, God said, eat the different meats. And three times, Peter refused. It reminds me of Peter denying Jesus three times by when the cock crows after Jesus' crucifixion. God asked Peter, who knows what is clean and unclean better than God's own self? Do not call something unclean that I have told you is clean, God says. Then Peter told the followers in Jerusalem that he and his companions witnessed a miracle. They witnessed the Gentile Pentecost. That's right. Just as the Holy Spirit came upon them, the Jewish followers in Jerusalem, it came and filled the Gentiles gathered there with Cornelius. The Holy Spirit descended and filled the uncircumcised and unclean. Peter simply stated that what he witnessed moved him so, so deeply, that he was compelled by God to baptize them all and stay with them for days at their invitation, which involved eating unclean foods. Because Peter said he could not argue with the work of the Holy Spirit. Marcus Borg states, in contrast to the purity system with its sharp social boundaries, the emergent Christian movement substituted a radically alternate social vision. The new community that Jesus announced would be characterized by interior compassion for everyone, not external compliance to a purity code, by radical inclusivity rather than by hierarchical exclusivity, and by inward transformation rather than by outward ritual. What happened at the Gentile Pentecost moment was utterly amazing. The wall that separated Gentiles and Jews was turned to rubble. The social and religious boundaries created millennia ago were challenged and dismantled by God. It was a huge moment. It seems that while the Jesus followers were striving to build their fledgling community and have some control over who was in and who was out, God had other plans. I don't really think what is of ultimate question in this scripture is pure and unpure food or about circumcision at all. It is about God going global and a reminder that no one religious group or people has a monopoly on God. It is about God reminding the early Christian church of God's own name and identity going back to the time of Moses, where God claimed God could not even be limited by having one name. When asked by Moses about God's name, God said God would be what God needed to be with the name I am that I am, or I will be what I will be, which really isn't a name for an entity that can be placed into a box, is it? God's own nature 
is one of fluidity and unboundlessness. Yes, my friends, God will relate and continue to relate to the people of Israel, but God is also the God of the Gentiles. In God's realm, every being and all of creation are counted in. This is a challenging text for us today as it was in the first century. We always need to be looking to see who is not sitting around our table, who we are excluding by choice, ignorance, or simple blindness. Perhaps, perhaps we need to stop excluding people from bathrooms and recognize the divinity in each person God created. Perhaps we need to open our borders to all and not use them to exclude the children of God, remembering that we were once strangers in a strange land. Perhaps we need to stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters and not hold them in constant suspicion due to their faith, remembering that they too are children of Abraham. Perhaps we need to be open to the Holy Spirit, inviting us and leading us to change. Perhaps we need to just get ourselves out of the way and let God be God. As Peter said, who am I to hinder God? To quote another Indian saint, Ramana Maharshi, when asked, how are we to treat others? He replied simply, there are no others. <clears throat> change does not come easy for us. We are afraid of change and that we will lose something if we do. We want to hold on tight to our possessions, customs, traditions, and rules that set us apart and that make us unique and special, but also keep us isolated and elite. Chapter 11 in the book of Acts reminds us that we cannot even use our most cherished beliefs and laws to exclude others from the love of God. If we do that, we are not choosing the path of new life. On this fifth Sunday in Easter, we hear Peter's witness to a major change through the work of the Holy Spirit. We realize that no one person, no organization, no religious community, and no political party has the singular blessing of God alone. We hear that God is out of the box, still speaking, and constantly challenging us to live out our inclusivity and God's unending, unconditional love. May we, may we as Easter people continue to affirm the way of new life. Amen and amen.
experienced both joyous and heart-wrenching sorrows. We learned of the devastating earthquake that ravaged the land and people of Ecuador. The flash floods that destroyed homes and took the lives of many here in the U.S. And the death of composer and singer Prince. We have also celebrated Mother Nature and all of creation with Earth Day on Friday as well as the joy-filled retelling of the Passover experience. As we enter into this time of prayer, we offer each of you some moments of stillness to speak to God, to offer up prayers that weigh heavy on your hearts and know that God cares. We offer you some quiet moments to express to God your gratitude for the beauty in the world, for family and friends, for life itself. We offer through communal stillness an intentional time to listen to God this day. We offer you some cherished moments to sit in peace and simply be with no external demands placed upon you. So as you're ready, take a slow, deep breath in and let it out gently. And let us be open to the presence of God together in a time of silence. God of all, you have gathered us here to refresh us, infuse us with your spirit, love us, and challenge us to be Easter people. You have heard our prayers offered in silence, and we have received your blessings. May the gift of the Holy Spirit be upon each of us in this community. And may we be open to recognize you throughout all of your creation. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, your risen Son, and all of the people of God say, Amen.
artist Picasso once said, everything you can imagine is real. And so like the prophets and the apostles and the disciples before us, we imagine the realness of peace on earth and healing of all, of children having enough to eat and everyone having shelter, where all live in unity and the earth is honored and its resources cared for and sustained. Reality is indeed what we create, and we do so by giving of our time, talent, and treasure. There are many ways through this church to give of your time, of your talents and skills, and at this moment in our worship each week, of your financial resources to assist in this hope and in this vision. And so I invite you now to give generously, generously of all that you have been blessed with as the ushers come forward and gather up our morning gifts.
and together we dedicate these gifts. We bring our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings to you, O God, because we have received them from you. We bring you our lives as well, because we have received them from your generous hand. Bless all that we bring, so that our gifts and our lives may be of service to you and agents of change according to your will. Amen. Just a reminder that following the benediction and the singing of the Alleluia, you are invited to join us in Fellowship Hall through the doors on my right to continue our celebration of fellowship and of Earth Day. And now, my friends, may the blessings of God warm you like the sun. May the love of Christ wash over you like a gentle rain. May the breath of the Holy Spirit infuse you with joy and be your ever-present guide on your spiritual path. Amen. Amen.